Hi, this is Jurgen Rasmussen. Welcome to the Provocative Hypnosis Vlog. Today, I want to talk a little bit about how I work with OCD clients, clients who struggle with what's called obsessive compulsive disorder, or more pragmatically, people who have thoughts that seem compulsive and compulsive behaviors. How to work with these people? Working with these clients can be tough. It can take a lot of work. <clears throat> it can be very strenuous. It's, it's hardly ever a walk in the park. And one reason for that is, is that if they have a lot of compulsive thinking and very busy minds, uh, there's a big chance that they're not going to hear anything that you're saying because the compulsive thoughts take up all the bandwidth and not only that it's often very hard for them to concentrate so a, a lot of the things that we often do is you know guiding people through various thought experiments and various imagination exercises or if you do hypnosis well that requires focus it, it requires concentration it, it it requires someone who can voluntarily engage with ideas but if someone has constant chatter in their mind and those thoughts look very dominant and seem to make them have to do something all the time, then it, it, it can be very difficult to even get anywhere. So the, the first thing I do is, is to make sure to disabuse them of the idea that they have a mental illness that this means that anything is 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 wrong with them per se or or uh that that this is evidence that something is wrong with their brain i i, I make sure that they get the frame that this is exclusively about thoughts and feelings and how you relate to them and that what we do together is a a psychoeducational approach where they're going to learn to relate to thoughts and feelings in a better way. So they're not a patient. I'm not a therapist. We're mutual explorers where I'm a guide and, and, and the person's actively exploring new ways to relate to thoughts and feelings. It's, ex it's extremely important to have commitment with the person, you know, that that you're, you have a commitment to, to do this until you get somewhere useful because, again, it can often take quite a bit of time. So I, I very often start out with teaching them breath work and trying to connect them with sensory experience, breathing meditation, stuff like that. And, and this is often very difficult for them because they'll be able to focus for two seconds and then they're back to their thinking again. But this is a bit like building a muscle. You know, every time they get lost in thought, notice it and choose to come back to the breathing, that builds their concentration, that builds their focus. Um, a lot of analogies, metaphors and exercises around, around the topic of watching thoughts, noticing thoughts seeing thoughts as thoughts. So I might do meditations with them, like thinking meditations, where their task is to try to notice whether a particular thought is an image, something they see, visualize, or whether it's more words, sentences, dialogue, monologue, music, something like that. So noticing image, word, word and image, uh, or to just say thought, if the thought seems kind of subtle and they're unable to really work out whether it's an image or word-based. Now, what's the point of this, you might ask? Well, thinking in of itself can seem very overwhelming. If you're overwhelmed by something, it really helps to chunk it down. So if, if you can take something that seems overwhelming at work, for example, and you can chunk it down into smaller components, then something that looked really big and really overwhelming 
suddenly looks pretty manageable. So just having this simple distinction of images versus words really chunks thoughts down, helps you sort them, and helps you notice that thoughts are indeed thoughts. And that's ironically what OCD people don't do. They kind of know that they're thoughts, but they, they don't really see the nature of thought. They try to solve thought and fix thoughts and think themselves out of thoughts and distract themselves from thoughts and having to act on thoughts. And, and, and this just revs up the entire thought engine. There, there are... Um, there are a few common, let's call it beliefs or notions that are typical, that, that, that I help them through inquiry to discover that's not quite the case. So, so the first is, it, it very often looks as if some thoughts come with the power to compel them to do something. Meaning, if I have the thought of touching the window, I have to touch the window. It really looks that way. So I do inquiry exercises where we really investigate the thought to see if the thought itself has the inherent power to make you have to do anything. The other kind of belief is, is the idea that the thought mandates a particular emotional response, meaning if this thought ap appears I'm gonna feel like this, with this sort of intensity. And it really looks that way, right? So we really explore those thoughts too and, and, and see if the thought itself has the power to make someone feel a particular way. Now, it actually doesn't, but it takes some, some exploration for people to discover that. The third one is the notion that one thought necessarily uh, mandates having to have a bunch of other thoughts around the topic. Meaning, if the thought first starts, I have to keep ruminating and, and, and thinking this stuff. So we really explore the nature of thought again to see if any thought has the power to compel another thought, to create or cause another thought. And the answer to all of these questions is no. The thought itself is completely neutral. It doesn't seem that way. It seems as if the thought has the power to mandate other thoughts, certain emotional responses, or certain behaviors. And it's, it's a damn compelling illusion. But it's possible to investigate this illusion in such a way that you have the realization that the thought itself is completely neutral might take quite a bit of work. This is what I teach in my psychological illusion model seminars and, and how I work with people. Um, sometimes it's extremely, you know, sometimes one thing that makes thoughts look very compelling is the notion that thoughts are in my head, in my skull, and the world is out there. That's also a psychological illusion. So helping people to, to realize that thoughts are not in their head, thoughts are actually in the open space of awareness. The sensations of a face and a head are just other thoughts or sensations in the same open space of awareness. Practicing having these thoughts while realizing that they're not occurring in your head, but in the open space of awareness can take a lot of the seeming punch out of them. So that's something to explore. You can also explore that through uh, Douglas Harding's uh, headless approach or check out Richard Lang on, on YouTube uh, if, if you want. Um, Something I picked up from Adrian Wells' metacognitive therapy, which has been useful in, in recent times, is to have people, to, to give credit where credit is due, is to have people verbalize the thoughts out loud while they're having them or acting upon them. So while they have the thought, you know, I, I need to touch the window, 
to verbalize, I have to touch the window. This helps the mind kind of see that this really is a thought. So thank you to my colleagues, Peter Jacobson and Kim Oixle. I, I butchered that name uh, always. They're two excellent uh, Danish uh, hypnotherapists who, uh, who both taught me a little bit about uh, this, this particular thing. Uh, a, a final thing that I picked up from Stephen Hayes and ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, is to have people deliberately violate their thoughts. So to, to have them, for example, say, I must raise my right arm while not raising it, you know? I must stand up while sitting down. Or the opposite, by saying, for example, it's impossible for me to raise my right arm. You know, I absolutely can't lift my left arm and show it to you like this. It's, it's not possible. But, but by doing this, you're, you're training your mind to violate thoughts. So you do it with thoughts you already know are neutral, and then you add some of these seemingly compulsive thoughts to the mix. And, and you do it, you do it on purpose. There's also something about, you know, exposure therapy, you know, so sometimes we, we, we do a lot of rumination in an effort to not feel. And, and people are often terrified of feeling certain feelings, so they're stuck in their head all the time. So helping them transition to getting access to sensory felt experience again. And, and to, to notice, to make the discovery that the feelings themselves are not threatening and neither are the thoughts. So I hope this quick video uh, is useful to you, inspiring. If you struggle with compulsive thinking, uh, compulsive behaviors, and you would like to change them, know that I see clients from all over this spinning planet uh, online. You can get in touch with me at provocativehypnosis.com. Uh, if you know someone who struggles with compulsive behaviors or thoughts, feel free to share this video with them. Um, it is possible to change your relationship to thoughts and feelings. It is possible for people who suffer and who suffer a lot to have a different relationship to thoughts and feelings. And, and sometimes it really helps to have someone to work with who has guided other people to create that different relationship. So if you have any questions, comments, observations, please feel free to share them wherever you locate this video. Thanks for listening.